Who, me? No. Oh. Um, hey, everybody. Was Jim hey, boys and girls. Hey, everybody. Johnny. Ooh, Where is John? Where's John? He's working. He said he's working. Yeah. He's got to yeah, run yeah, back and forth. Of, yeah, because he's getting sounds. He's doing something. He's doing something. Uh, What's he doing? Getting a kick drum sound with Mutt Lang? I think he was getting my coffee now, actually. It, well, I I just a little milk, just a little color, John. He always great gave me great John's milk. down at Smilers oh. getting a lunch. Smilers, there you go. <laughs> Is there you know, still Smilers in New York? I think you so. You know, I don't think so. No. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jay, is, this, is the one on 8th Avenue still there? 9th Avenue. 9th Avenue. 9th Avenue, right. yeah. 9th Avenue. I haven't seen that. 44th Street. Isn't it? 45th Street. Hey, Shelly, what'd you do? Get like a haircut or something? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, okay. Uh, oh, there it oh, is. There. Oh, Shelly. Hey, Shelly. I brushed, oh, I took the right. shower and brushed it back. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Yeah, I love what you're doing with your hair, Shelly, really. <laughs> so so is this right. build as a history? Is this open to the public? Are there people watching this besides yeah. skulls? Apparently, oh, yeah. Well, let's oh, see. A lot of people, I'm right, sure. Right. A lot we'll, of people. Find that, we'll find out in a minute, and they can kind of call in and ask us questions, and we can oh, pass really? it on. Oh, oh, my. Okay. Well, what, what, what do you, what, what you talk yeah, You want a little moderate or something? You know what I'm saying? I mean, we're just supposed to bust yeah. balls. We, we busted it. <laughs> Balls. I thought it was billed as uh, a history of record plants. Yeah. So who started first? Okay, so Shelly yeah. first. I'm Shelly. second. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. Sh Shelly, right? Wait, my hair's all screwed up. Oh, well, Shelly and Jay were there first. No. Shelly no, first, right? then me. So, yeah. so uh, just... Uh, Before Jay? No, so just a little yeah. bit of history. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Shelly, lean into that mic. Can you hear me now? Yes. Better when uh, just a little bit of history. So I was at a and recording for a couple of years, which was another great training ground. And uh, Roy got an offer to leave from Chris Stone and bring his clients over. This is probably about 19, beginning of 1970. And, uh, oh, Roy, and I, Roy and I were at uh, a and and uh, I kind of got my feet wet over there. And he called me one day and he said, Shelly, you know, I'm over at, uh, I'm over at the record plant with Chris Stone. And um, part of my deal is to bring my clients over. The problem is you have most of my clients. I, <laughs> I gave you most of my clients. And uh, if you don't come over here, quit and come over here, I'm going to kick your ass. <laughs> so a couple of months later, I, I gave my, uh, you know, I, I gave my notice and came over to Record Plant and and uh, the first session I did, Paul from Peter Paul and Mary was doing his own album over there with Tom Fly, and um, and uh, I had worked with Paul when he was with Peter Paul and Mary and Phil Ramone and and Roy and and uh, he you know he he did the last part of his album with me and we did. Uh, uh, we did the wedding song, There is Love, you know, that just the guitar and and uh, it was probably played at almost everybody's wedding after that. And then, um, you know, Record Plant was an amazing place. And then you guys started to come over one at a time, you know, and and uh, I, I, it was the greatest camaraderie, the greatest place to make a record. Look, there were other great studios in town. But there was something about that record plant vibe and Chris being there. And then, you know, Chris would go, Chris and Gary Kellegren would go between uh, the LA studio, their LA record plant and, uh, and, um, and New York. And pretty soon a lot of people wanted to uh, do their albums and do their singles at record plant. And we were, all the rooms were full and everybody was working and, you know, then Jack came and, Jay and somebody uh, fill me in here before I start to look foolish. Well, <laughs> who, who was next? I was. Ah, uh, so uh, so Shelley got the date wrong because I started uh, July of 1969. I walked in. I, I had been an artist recording at A and R with Tony May. Tony and May taught me. <laughs> 
Go ahead. Sorry. So, um, and I asked uh, Tony if I could get a job at A&R and he sent me down to record plant. And wow. Paul Presto Pino, that was July of 69. Jeez. Uh, uh, Paul Presto Pino hired me on the spot while I stood in the reception office as the janitor. <laughs> and um, and I, I was a janitor till I got a union janitor, I believe Ernie was his name. Is that right, Jay? Yeah, Ernie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and then I moved to to uh, general worker, and um, General. they were mixing uh, uh, the um, Woodstock Festival in Studio A. I think it was Gary uh, Gary Kelgren was was in there mixing it. Geez. Now, when I came into Record Plant, there was like there were two schools. There was Roy and Shelley, and me. Uh, we were like, and Carmine Rubino. Jack and, Adams. And no, there was another school. See, there was Chris Stone's school, which was Gary Kelgren, Tom Fly, Jack Adams, and then all those assistants that worked under him. And we were all ass assistants competing to get dates. And they would cut your throat for a date. <laughs> so it was it was like really I, you know Shelly you didn't know this but it was like really competitive and they did everything they could to stomp on you to make sure you didn't get dates so Tom <laughs> wow. had his favorites Jack Adams had his favorites and and um, and finally I got I got in with uh, with Shelly uh, who was like really tough but it was great to work with him and I was on those uh, uh, Paul Stuckey dates and that was 12 track, as I recall, which was wow. an odd kind of uh, uh, format, but it was 12 track, right, Shelly? It was 12. Yeah, 12 track. I remember. One right. inch, right? Yes. One inch, not 12 track. Yes, yeah. and then we went to 16, two inch. Yeah. At some point. Was that 12 track of Scully? No, I don't remember. Uh, I no, the, wasn't it the, um, was it the MCIs? I think it was, was an it? MCI. The big um, MCIs that we had. Yeah. Now, after a while, Roy took me on, and then I became like Roy's guy for a while. I suggested, I brought in uh, 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 Frank Ubeck, and I brought in um, Dennis Ferranti. Dennis. Uh, uh, Dennis uh, had been a singer in a band I was in. He didn't know the first thing about it. But there were two great ways of getting a job at Record Plant that Roy was kind of running at this point. And that, although Jack Adams was the chief engineer, and that was you had to have a goofy personality or you had to be Italian. <laughs> uh -huh. And then shortly after that, Jay Messina came in. And what they Which wanted. One was he? <laughs> they wanted the commercials they wanted the ad dates at jay was doing all the ad dates and i can remember assisting jay and um and he would do like a 30 piece date in in four hours that ford or you know some airline company would walk out with a completed mix just setting up the chairs alone you would have to be in there two hours ahead of time and then jay would walk in about 45 minutes before the date and i remember the first time working with him he handed me a little black pill and he said you're gonna need this <laughs> <laughs> it a black oh pill. my god <laughs> oh, and I already I him mind. so fucking fast <laughs> to keep up with him uh, but but uh, so that was my early experiences uh, so i'll turn it over to who's next uh, well, I, I came hey. next and uh hey. i was at a and r with shelly and roy also and then the, those guys went over and roy would call me and say you got to come and check this place out so i went over one night and i slipped into studio a and I think it was Jack Adams. I think he was doing some vocals with The Who. And Jack Adams used to monitor with all five quad speakers on at the same time <laughs> with the monitor pot all the way open. I was just listening. <laughs> and, oh. and I walk in and all I hear was the, the breathing of the <laughs> whoever was doing the singing. 
And I'm thinking, man, if anybody hits play, this is going to tear my head off. It's so loud, you know. And luckily, I was able to get out be before that happened. But it it blew me away. Just the whole vibe of the place. It was like the coolest club to go to. You know, just walking in that front door, it was like being in the, you know, the uh, like Regines or the coolest club in town. And I remember Don Fry, who ran and was one of the owners at uh, A and R, was saying, "Well, you know, can we give you more money?" You know, and I said, "No, no, I think I'm, it's time for me to make a move." And he says, "Well, you're going to the right place." I remember telling you that. Well, and I went guy. over and had the toughest time at first because A and R was so alive, and at that time at, at Record Plant. Everything was rose, you know, pretty much, <laughs> almost. And it was Jack so rose. good. I had the hardest time adjusting to that. And it was tough for the bringing jingle uh, people over there because A and R was like all about service and you know get them in, get them out, and it's, it's a service oriented kind of studio. Record plant was more of a records, you know, and laid back and wasn't conducive to doing. It sounds like all you guys kind of defected from A and R. Did A and R? Did they have a vibe about all you guys leaving? Like, was there any competitiveness between? Um, I don't think so. No. no, we we like we would do our string dates, you know, at uh, over at A one at uh, on Seventh Avenue. Right. And we were pretty, you know, we were all friends with Phil, Ramon, and uh, so, you know, it wasn't competitive at there all. There was enough really. work to go around, too, right? Oh, yeah, there yes. was. The softball games were competitive. We used to play <laughs> that in the park. And so who was next? Was Rod, Rod O'Brien. Oh, yeah, I guess, yeah. Um, Jack, you said you started in 69? Yeah. I think I came over in the middle of 70. Yeah, I think so, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I had tried to get a, I had tried to get a job there. I had dropped a resume off and I'd come back. And um, that building was a nightmare for me anyway, because on the ninth floor of that building was my draft board. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I didn't like being there at first, but then I went in a couple of months later and I asked if they still had the resume. And there was a guy standing behind uh, Carmelita, or was it D? Maybe it was D. Remember D? At the sure. Yeah, D. Lee. Uh, and uh, he said, Oh, no, he's not here anymore. I'm the new studio manager. I have your resume. And I went, Oh, okay. And he goes, check back with me. So I go out and I went, I stopped at the coffee stand in the, in the lobby and he comes out a minute later and he says, I didn't want to say anything, but I'm firing the guy that was standing next to me. Call me on Friday. <laughs> he fired his brother-in-law. <laughs> Mitch, Mitch fired his brother-in-law, whose name I think was Dennis, because he said he's a complete fuck up. My wife's going to hate me. Oh. <laughs> and I started the following week doing what Jack was saying. I would go in, empty the garbage, sharpen the pencils, all that kind of crap. And the first day I met Jack, he was in the closet at A and pulling everything out because we were going to paint it. Hmm. I don't know if you remember that. We yeah. pulled, remember we pulled all the headphones out and the, yeah. the direct boxes. And I'm like, so what's this place like? And he's like, oh, it's great. You're going to love it. And I had no idea whatsoever uh, what kind of a studio it was. And then all of a sudden, it's like, here's John Lennon and uh, Three Dog Night and the Raspberries with Shelly and Tom flies upstairs doing Don McLean. And I'm like, holy shit. Um, I walked into the right place. And I have to thank Mitch for that. <laughs> Mitch. And, um, Mitch Not Plotkin? Yeah, yeah, Plotkin. He fired yeah. his brother-in-law to hire me. Oh, he was there way before Paul Sloman? Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Way yeah. before. This was, yeah. In, this was, like I said, somewhere in the middle of 1970. And the first time I did a gig, uh, Carmine Rubino was doing something with Gary's sister. I can't remember her name. Gary Kelgren's sister. Yeah, she was producing some R and B band with horns and the whole thing, and 
he said, you want to do a demo with me on the weekend? And I said, sure. I didn't know what the hell was going on. And I walked in and there was like four horn players and keyboard players and guitar players and this whole R&B thing. And she was trying to do it live and it was a disaster, but Carmine was great. And then I started working with uh, uh, Tom Fly for a while. And then I, Shelly um, and, uh, and Stuart, you guys had, um, what's his name on from um, Gear Sluts last week, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, we did. And he was talking about something that Jack knows what I'm talking about, because I think it was Bob Ezra and I first saw put the 57 on the console in the, in the, in the tissue box and do a human beatbox. Yeah. Jack, uh, you used to do it too. Yeah. I used yeah. to do a cowbell in a booth. Yeah. Well, Just but a lot of times we would do it from the control room. Yeah. You know, because like, okay, here comes the break. We better keep them in time. Yeah. Well, I would let some bands speed up a little bit for the chorus and then bring them back down for the. Yeah. Verse. We didn't have a click track. No. And I'm glad we didn't. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. You know, Carmine Rubino was another guy that uh, came over from A&R, as did Mitch, I believe. I, yeah. yeah, right, Jay? Did yeah. Mitch come from and, and, and so yeah. did, and didn't Jimmy Iovine come over from A&R? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, we, no, Jimmy, did, Jimmy didn't work at A&R, did he? Yes, yeah. he did. Donnie, yeah. Han, yeah. Donnie Han called me and said, you know, we're, we're going to lay off a few people here from a and r and uh and uh we're gonna start with the newest hires first and we got this kid jimmy jimmy iovine I, I, I think could do well but he needs like you know he needs to be to be a gopher and a general and can you use somebody over there you know sure send them over and i met jimmy and we hired him and you know and then he had all you guys paint <laughs> <laughs> in the tape library, but anyway, yeah. So that so Jimmy came over then as an assistant, yeah. as a gopher actually. Yeah. Well, we all. I mean, I started out. Uh, what we we used to call it what a general, right? General. Yeah, yeah general. general. Yeah. And you just did whatever. General you, duties. Yeah. But but well, Jay and Shelley, you guys were already doing full sessions oh, yeah. at A and R, right? Yeah. You were you were not assisting. You were doing full sessions by the yeah time the but you realize Shelley came from uh he came from a background of recording because his father and his uncle had uh Yakis brothers studios in boston right oh, oh yes i did yeah, yeah, Shelley was, Shelley was born in a vocal recording right <laughs> <laughs> born in a direct <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. uh, everybody heard that actually did they? <laughs> we heard and see then you showed up right no no wasn't greg there before way before me oh that's right sure yeah, greg. yeah yeah no i think i might have been next on, on this on this line because uh yeah rod was uh rod was just kind of starting to do gigs on weekends and stuff i uh you know i came in on the truck actually because uh you know i had i had absolutely no experience at all with recording i was you know i played guitar and i used to you know sing in a band in high school i didn't know jack shit i had gotten out of graduate school i was going to be it's a, right over there yeah it is. <laughs> yeah I, I, I was i i was selling i was selling shoes and flushing lady shoes and flushing after i got out of school and i got a i got a call do you want to work on the truck man so i i came uh it was before dave viewer too and uh, Frank, Frank, Eubank, Eubank, Frank, right? Eubank. Frank, yeah. Frank was running the truck. And then the, the great thing about the truck was, for, you know, like the first gig, the very first gig was a yes in Duke University, close to the edge tour. I mean, like a huge band. Oh, wow. And I went from knowing absolutely nothing, driving the truck. My friend Tom and I drove the truck down. I ran over a deer and killed a deer on Route 95 on the way to the gig. Blood on the back yeah. of the truck. Had to go wash it off. Yeah, that, that we got down. <laughs> Unbelievable. And uh. then, uh, you know, by getting on the truck, though, I got to meet you guys who were, you know, I mean, Jay would come in and engineer sometime. Uh, different guys would work with Frank right at the board. Frank was more like the tech guy. And then, uh, you know, some different guys would come into the to work on the truck. So I get to meet everybody. And then at one point, the general job came up after I did. I must have done about maybe half a dozen um of the live gigs and just carrying the wires around i didn't know anything 
And then the general job came up. Mitch hired me, and I came in with knowing absolutely nothing, and and uh, didn't know that much more when I started cutting <laughs> a couple of years later. But how did you wind uh, up cutting? How did you get up there? Because my friend Tom, who got me the job, he, he George Marino was was cutting, and he had a, he had some kind of a business dispute with Roy. He was partnered up with Roy in the cut master cutting room, which was upstairs, and. A couple of months after I started as general, George had a blowout with Roy and he ended up going to Sterling. And Tom had all these giant cutting notes that he just couldn't do all the changes. There are all these knob changes that George used to do. George was fantastically organized. Tom had just learned how to cut like six months or nine months before. So I used to say, he used to call me upstairs and in between on the fade, the fader would, st the, the fade would start coming down. All of a sudden he'd go, go. And I turn 120 cycles, boom, boom, boom mid-range boom boom you know and it was all these mechanical moves that george would do with two hands we used to have to do with four and this so is on a lathe it, on a lathe like the lathe had to be moved you had to you had to do the spiral you had to you know the uh, prestopino and penn stevens would come in sometime and they used to call us amateur city they would just shake their head amateur <laughs> city man look at you guys what the hell's wrong with you it's ridiculous so uh but but i learned you know i learned kind of by i didn't never really learn how to cut records from anybody other than you know, when Shelly would come upstairs and uh, or the, any of the engineers would come up and probably be scared to death that we're going to fuck their record up. I think uh, I think that's basically it. So I, I kind of learned, you know, I, I really learned a lot about the dynamics of, of what people thought about mastering. We didn't just call it mastering, it was cutting. But we, I used to, I learned a lot about how the, the mixer and the recording engineer and, the, you know, the project is really not the not my project in the cutting room. You know, it's these guys. And, you know, Shelly taught me more about, you know, I always, Shelly, I got to always thank you. And I do every time, man. I, you know, you taught me more. Jay taught me, oh, Jack taught me. All you guys taught me a, a really a, a lot about cutting actually without even knowing that you did. So. You know, and Roy used to go in and do half speed, right? Roy, Roy had, the, he, he had the scully he hooked up. He had a special EQ on that scully running at half speed. And then the, the lathe, we had to, we had the, uh, the the little there's little boxes that you put in, right. and that was and he used to do a lot of singles that way. A lot of the Lennon we used to do some of the Lennon singles that way. But man, you got it. You know, a four minute song is eight minutes of yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. But it was hot. It came out hot. Oh, it came, yeah. the high end was unbelievable. It was it was there's a guy in London. I just visited him last year. But not Miles Showell at Abbey Road. He still does a lot of half speed cutting and. Man, you got to bring a book, man, because you got a twenty-minute side. You got forty minutes of uh, you know slow motion. It's a whole other thing. <laughs> you know, but, uh, not many it. people know this, but Jay Messina started out as a cutting, right, right, and right. he had and he had a very special assistant who would you know put the, the <laughs> disc in the sleeve. Jay, who was your assistant over there? Yeah, Bob Ludwig. <laughs> I hired, <laughs> oh, I hired him for me, and I had to train. Bob, you know, whether it's the way you put the discs in the, in the uh, jackets and, uh, you know, basically showed him the ropes. And uh... when, when we went up to Bob Ludwig's place to, uh, no, I didn't know this, but we went up to Bob Ludwig, Ludwig's place in, uh, in Maine to uh, master a Super Tramp album, which Jay, myself, and a member of the band. And when we got there, uh, Bob Ludwig started bowing down to Jay, and I'm going, "What the hell is going on here?" <laughs> Doesn't everybody bow to Jay? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, people that are on the payroll. Bob and I started uh, I'll within a my week. Twenty dollars. <laughs> Bob I'm Ludwig and I started within a week of each other at at A and R, and part of their training there was to you'd go into the cutting room before you'd be. Uh, an assistant so you had to follow a certain path because they wanted to they had a certain way of training everybody so i remember bob going bob was in there when i came and i'd go and visit him because he was right in back of the studio and he said to me i said i'm not sure about this mastering stuff i think i think i i i think i'd like to be an assistant and be a gopher and be an assistant and be an engineer he said he said if you get in this room and you're any good at it, you're not getting out. Because, well, I would skip it. And I did. I did. When I was in there, Roy Sakala, as well as being an engineer, was the maintenance man. So whenever I had a problem with the lathe, you know, with the chip jar or whatever, Roy would be the guy who would come and fix it. Yeah, it's strange. So Roy was a Hammond organ repair man. 
in wow. Connecticut. Oh, wow. really? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. that's how he and that's how he got it to the business. Wow. Roy also liked to throw limiters across the room. Oh, yeah. didn't work. I've missed it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at at A and R, the home maintenance department at at night would go up onto the roof of uh, seven. 799 Seventh Avenue with binoculars and watch the girls with their tricks across the street at the hotel. <laughs> and they'd have a <laughs> and they had a buzzer. So when <laughs> Phil would call, when Phil would be doing a session and he would call into maintenance and say, I got a problem, it would ring on the roof. And it would, after a while, he and they would run down and come in the room like they came from the shop. <laughs> and somehow he figured out what they were doing and he snuck up there. And put shoe polish on the things for the binoculars. <laughs> so, so one day, so one day he calls them, and they come and, and they argue, hey guys, send a couple of guys in there. Say, you got guys. I need somebody right away. I got a problem. So this guy comes running in, out of breath. I forget who it was, but he had like raccoon eyes. It was like, <laughs> it was unbelievable. You never went up there, did you, Charlie? And then, then I, I remember after assisting, after assisting for a few years there, I remember Roy saying, "Listen, Shelley, you, you you need to start engineering. I know you can do this." And and the fact is, when you're an assistant and you're and you're sitting behind the engineer and you go from that chair to his chair, everything sounds totally different. You don't know what the hell you hear, and suddenly you're ten feet closer to the speakers, and it's all. New and I remember Roy calling me one night for a, it was a session. It was a seven o'clock start at A and R that he was supposed to do. And he calls me and he says, he says, "Hey, Shelley, listen, I'm home. Uh, you're doing the session." And I said, "Roy, I, I, I'm not ready to do the session. I, 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 I'm not, I'm not ready. Are you serious?" And he and I was like uh, whining about it. And he said, "Well, I'm really not home. I'm in the next room, you big baby." <laughs> he came in and he came in and he did the session. So a few nights later, so we started seven o'clock. I get this phone call. He says, "Tonight I'm really home, and you're doing the session." And that's how he got me out of my uh, my fear and my uh, you know, could I could I really do it and could I handle doing a session myself? You know, Shelley, were you did you work at your father's place? Yeah, I was like a, I was a gopher there and uh, and uh, an assistant kind of, and I really didn't do any engineering except uh, a late night group on my own just to try to figure everything out. But I really didn't get to engineer anything there till I, I used to hear tapes, four track tapes that came into my dad's place from New York, you know, with the whole rhythm section combined on one track, and it would sound amazing. And in Boston there was there wasn't a lot of demand like um if if somebody would book my dad's studio my uncle was the engineer uh they didn't demand much they just came in and expected the engineer uh, to do the session and give them a final product but i could hear that the tapes that came in from new york had something unique and special and and it turned out that in new york the the clients were demanding a lot of the engineers. No, the bass drum is not right. No, no, that snare drum sucks. No, no, come on, let's get a better voice on. Whatever it might be, and you were pushed to to a higher level just out of demand, and you had to learn how to give it to them, or or you weren't going to work, you know. Right. But uh, my dad's studio was a was a great sounding place, and uh, you know, it, it, without that experience, I learned to hear there. That that was the great thing about working there, and. Uh, it was pretty cool. You know, one step up the ladder uh, at Record Plant was uh, you would uh, do demos for people. And and Roy would insist that you do the demos four track. Two track for me. Why was that? Two track for you? Four track. So you had to do a mix, the whole rhythm section, uh, and allow a track for overdubs. Uh, and it was a great learning experience. Oh. Wow. And he, he, uh, he let us have free time, you know, after midnight to do things. And there was, that's how we learned. I mean, he was very generous with that. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, so, the way he trained us was really, I don't remember him yelling at anybody. It was always like uh, somebody would bring the pizza 
uh, go for a, a general would go get a pizza and bring it back without the pepperoni. And he'd look at him and say, so you don't like pepperoni, huh? <laughs> kid would say, what are you talking about? He'd say, well, there's none on here. I guess you don't like it because no, we don't have it. Oh, my God. But he had I don't a know. He yelled at me a couple of times. He fired me a couple of times. But he, he probably deserved it. <laughs> one, of them was, one of them was on a session with you and uh, Ina. Really? At pie fight. <laughs> I don't remember him raising his voice, but I'll tell you what, when he talked, everyone listened and uh, it, it was pretty great. Yeah, great. it was great. You know, the, the thing yeah. is, when all of those guys went out to the West Coast, Tom Fly, uh, well, Jack Adams, he didn't really go out to the West Coast, but uh, uh, Gary Kelgren and then the whole crew went out there. That's when a lot of us got to move up, make a, a big move up. To becoming engineers all right and 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 steve you when did you get there <clears throat> how you doing I, I i'm blown away by the i didn't realize record plan started in 69 so you guys probably saw hendrix when he recorded there right uh, he, he was recording uh, early in 69 we missed it <clears throat> and yeah, when plan started in 68 when did hidley do uh, a in 69 and 70. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. They had a weird they had a weird board in there when you play yeah. back. It would play back through all the everything you had patched in instead of a separate playback. Oh. You have to pull <laughs> your patch cords halfway out and then then uh, Roy Jack, do you remember Jay, do you remember when he got the spectro, Spectrosonics board? Oh, absolutely, yeah. What year? About 70. So, yeah, Roy, we did, uh, we did the Who record on it. So Roy is standing there with this board that just came probably a few days before. It's being wired up. And some of the modules or sections are out of the board, but the board's there and there's meters and, you know, a bunch of the EQs are in, but a bunch are out. And Roy is standing there in, in his right hand. He has a cup of coffee and he's just looking over the console. And I'm to his right. And I turned and I'm like, I'm pretty new. And I turned to him and I hit his arm and the coffee oh, was flying oh. on top of the board. Oh. <laughs> and I'm standing there watching it drain onto the floor and I couldn't apologize enough time and Roy said, just hold on. And he turned the board off and he poured water all over the board. I said, Roy, I, I, I said, Roy, didn't I do and make enough of a mess? You pouring water all over the board? He said, don't worry, it'll be fine. He said, the sugar from the coffee will ruin everything mm -hmm. and we'll dry it off with hair dryers and before we turn it back on. And don't you know, it took a, a couple of days later after it was all dry, he turned it on and it was fine. But man, I, I thought I thought yeah, I'd never get a good. job in this business again. <laughs> I thought I was a goner. I figured he'd wait till I cleaned that mess up and then kick my ass out of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I uh, getting back to me. Um, <laughs> no, I was always as a kid. My, my brothers played music. My cousin was in the Four Seasons, and he lived upstairs from me. So I, I came from a musical family. And when I was a junior in high school, I took the Recording Academy, the Recording Institute of Academy. It was a ten-week program every Saturday in New York at I want to say Allegro Studios. Was that downstairs, Allegro? I Allegro, I think, was in the basement of 1619 Broadway. Very, exactly. Yeah. Tony May was my instructor. Oh, wow. And, you know, he was this, you know, in my mind, he was like seven feet tall and 100 oh, pounds <laughs> with an afro like that. And he was by far the coolest guy I'd ever seen ever in my life. But, yeah. you know, and I, I learned from taking those courses, this is not for me because it's way over my head. So after I graduated, I, I, I didn't go to college. I got a job at General Motors in 76. And in 78, they stopped uh, the, the line to retool from May until September. I was collecting my pay. And I ran into my cousin, Joey, and he says, I was on the phone with my friend, Roy Sakala. And I said, Roy Sakala, the record plant. I remember reading his name and the name record plant on records. That's how I knew I wanted to be an engineer. I says, I want to do that. So long story short, Joey hooked me up with Roy, 
and I met him, and it was instant <clears throat> fondness on his part. And like you said, I mean, you all know the way Roy and I, Roy was with me for the first couple of years. I was like his boy, you know, I even got teased by that. So, but, uh, I, you know, I was with him from, you know, and, and in 78, he might have just started making sort of like a comeback because he took a couple of years off, I, I gather, no? And then later on in 78, he produced Orleans and, and uh, Garland Jeffries. He hadn't done anything in a while. No? Well, it was always engineering. Right. Yeah. And then he started going over all these old tapes, and I was with him, all, all the Lennon tapes and stuff. And <clears throat> I helped him when he tuned the room. I had no idea what he was doing. And um, I was in a session, Rod, where he took that, what was it, the the volume max or the whatever those <laughs> No, no, they're uh, the CBS. Oh, his, uh, the CBS volume maxes that, that he had in his rack. Yeah, he called the maintenance department three times. The third time, once Barish brought it back, he whipped it. Uh, it was in B. He whipped it across the, the wall. He goes, now they got to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> so he definitely had it. I saw the temper for sure. But uh, I, I enjoy hearing all these stories. I, I And also... When I when I first walked in, I remember opening up this door. It said "Record Plant" carved in wood from Julie Last. Right. And I opened the door, and the first person I see was Denise, the receptionist. Right. 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 Yeah. It was like I knew right then and there. I said, "I want to be here," you know. And I walked in, and and at that time, Penn, you were having a, a party for Penn and Stevens because he was retiring, and they made him a big cake made out of a, a screwdriver. How's that from memory? Wow. And, uh, yeah. and then I knew as soon as I walked in, it was like uh, I was hooked instantly. I says, I, I definitely want to be here. And I'm so glad I, I, I was a part of that. And did you, you start assisting with some... for these guys? What's that? Did you start assisting for these guys? I assisted for uh, just about everyone except Ed and Greg. Yes, I assisted for all of them. I assisted Jack when, when John was at the record plant for those last eight days. I was with Jack. Even though there was another guy kind of engineering, Jack was behind the board. Jay and I, I mean, I can write a book just on the sessions Jay and I did because let's just put it this way. Jay, not only was he great and fast, as you say, Jack, but he just liked to cut up just a little bit, just a little fun. <laughs> oh, no. Jay, no, very serious. Jay and I were on the same wavelength when it comes, comes to things being funny and there would be something going on in a session. Somebody would say something, and I would think it's funny, but all you would have to do, all Jay would have to do is like, just give me that little smirk from the console. <laughs> and, and there were times I'd have to run out of the session because I'd be laughing so much. So he did it to me today, too. You guys didn't catch on. <laughs> no, that, that, you know, the, the whole thing, thing about throwing, uh, throwing Flickingers. Uh, yeah. So I was out on the, I guess, 74, so, something like that. I was out in California, my first real trip as a producer in California, and I was working at Sunset Sound, and there was an LA-2A in the room, and it didn't work. I sent it to maintenance. They sent it back. Twice they sent it back, and on the third time, when it didn't work right, I threw it out in the parking lot. I thought, I'm really cool here, you know, I'm doing a Royce Gala. And they gave me a they gave me a bill for like two thousand like, dollars. Oh, that, that, that story cool. that story I told about Roy when he threw it, he goes, you know, now they're gonna have to fix it. it reminds yeah. me in um what's it called? What's um the, the movie with De Niro when he's a bus driver? Uh Bronx Tale. Bronx yeah. Tale, yeah. When the oh, scene yeah. at the bar when the bikers come in and 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 Joe Pub, what's his name? The the actor, he closed the door, he goes, Now you can't leave. Like that, yeah, yeah. That's, that, that was for Roy. Now they got to fix it. You know, that was so Roy. So, but the one thing also before I get, uh, uh, is the thing that you were talking uh, before, Jack, about how it was at the record plant. There, there, was, um, there was like protocol at the record plant. And I'm not talking about a dress code or anything like that. And I'll tell you, one of the ones I learned a lot from was Gray Russell. Um, you know, it's just how to act in a session, how to, you know, not only to make all your patches correct the first time and do everything perfect, but also you're, you're working for, I hate to use the word client, but you have to, you know, we're in the, we're in the uh, people business, you know, we're in the service industry. So you have to make sure that they are really, really comfortable and happy and you have to be cool amongst them.
And, you know, I, I had, you know, Jay was one of my best teachers as far as acting cool, because I mean, you know, look at him, right? So, but I, I've carried that, I've carried that with me throughout my whole career. So, yeah. Did anybody, uh, well, none of you guys ever assisted Carmine Rubino, I assume. Uh -huh. I did. You did? Yeah, no, he I was so I, nervous before a session that he'd sometimes go in the bathroom and throw up. Wow. <laughs> he would, he would, he would, <laughs> <laughs> so nervous. Now I stay in touch with Carmine, and he said he was never so relieved as when he left that business. Wow! Wow! He he seems you know, I so. I did calm. a lot of the. Um, what was the guy with uh, the the jazz label? Uh, oh, yeah. Bob uh, Bob Shed. Bob, Bob Shed. Shed. Who is who, who is Judd Apatow's grandfather? <laughs> yes. Yes. Wow. Yeah. But, yeah, I did a That's bunch amazing. of those with Carmine, and we'd go in, and it'd be like. Uh, you do an entire jazz album in you know, like four hours. Yeah, right. Not, not one song, but the entire album. That's right. Because yeah. he never did more than one take. And yeah. You know, I, said, oh, I blew a layers. note in the bridge. Don't worry about it. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. He used to. I did some work with him. He used to say to me, "Hurry up." He said, "We got to mix ten songs today." Or what? Are yeah. It was insane. He yeah. said, yeah. Not, if "There's a hit on here. It's going to show up, no matter how much time you spend on it." Yeah. Maybe we'll come back and remix it if something shows so one of these songs looks like it's going to do good. And then he'd get in his private <laughs> plane, fly around the country, and pick up royalty money from <laughs> all over the country. Well, I, one, one engineer made me. Oh, sorry, Rod, go ahead. No, but I think Shed was the guy, Bob Shed yeah. was the guy who found or, or first recorded Janis Joplin. Right, that's what that's I heard. Well, yeah, yeah. on Main Street. Was it mainstream? Mainstream, yeah. Was yeah. Main wow. Right? Yeah. Wow. And that was. Uh... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. One, one engineer made me nervous. I remember reading the schedule. Remember the schedules we used to get on the long. Yeah. Hey. Not only four studios, but the cutting room and two trucks. Look at me. I feel like it's like it's like this. No. Um, <laughs> one only one engineer made me nervous. I saw the schedule on a Friday and my weekend was shot and I was scared to death because I had never worked with him before. I'm pointing to him, but you don't know who I'm pointing to. Shelly, um, I, I oh, see you on mixing Graham Parker in Studio C with Jimmy and Jimmy was on the phone with Mark Knopfler because he was, you were, you were doing that record next. But, so uh, I hope I wasn't a jerk off. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, it was great. It was great. I had a great time. Oh, Thank good. You. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for saying I that. I did the nice. Graham Parker record. Was there two Graham Parker records done at Record Player? <laughs> oh, I, there might have been. The Up Escalator was the name of that record. Oh, okay. Yeah, a lot of that was done, I think. And I think we did a bunch of it in Europe, and then we, yeah. we may have mixed it in. We mixed it at Record Player. Nicky Hopkins was there. I remember him. Oh, yeah, I love Nicky. I was doing I was doing the knack at the at power station, and and mixing and Graham Parker at uh, record plant at the same time, and running back and forth between studios. Yeah. And Nikki Nikki died here, you know, Nikki Hopkins. Yeah. 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 I have some his biography right now. Oh wow! Oh, oh. Kind of an yeah. unbelievable book. He was and a lovely guy. Oh, that's a really yeah. nice guy. I wanted to hire Nikki to play on um, on on John Sessions when I did uh, Double Fantasy, and uh, and Yoko said to me, she said, "Do me a favor and don't hire Nikki to work with John because when they get together, it can be trouble, um, and we don't and we don't want trouble." So I mean, I had worked with Nikki on a bunch of records in England and in, in America, and there was never a problem. Maybe it was fucked up, and I didn't know it. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, Yoko was watching out for John to make sure that he, there were no people in there that would get him in trouble. And hey, Jack, hey, Jack, speaking of double fantasy, so you started that at the Hit Factory? I started it and pretty much did all of it there. How come you didn't do it at the, at the record plant? Well, because John wanted a place uh, where he... First of all, it was a secret project and you couldn't walk into record plant without being noticed. Right. But the original hit factory was way, was over between 9th and 10th Avenue. And so you could get in and out of there and it wasn't a well-known studio. I mean, where Steer is, right? Yeah. Steer is now, right? Yeah, yeah. That's the same room, uh, though smaller now. 
but uh, I felt terrible about bringing it over to Hit Factory because, you know, obviously there was a problem between Roy and, and Germano. So, but it was the only other good studio in town that was off the beaten track. Yeah. And, you know, otherwise I would have been doing that record at Record Plant with Jay. And, uh, you know, um, it, it couldn't be done that yeah. way. And so, but so we did come back later and uh, we did maybe one mix in Studio B, uh, but John felt like he liked that room over there and that Neve board. And so after doing one mix in Studio B, we went back to record plan. Again, it broke Roy's heart and he yeah. didn't forgive me for a long time for that. But I had no, yeah. you know, I wasn't in charge of that. He but, did his last uh, session at record plan. But yeah, we went back, you know, I really wanted to go back to record plant. And so when John called me up and said, let's go back in the studio, I said, can we go to record plant now? And, uh, and we did, we, we did uh, walking on thin ice and we would have done a lot more work if it wasn't for the terrible ending that, that we had. And Steve, there was no other engineer. I was engineering and producer. I, no, I know, I know you were. Oh, okay, there's someone yeah. else. Well, you call, Jack, you called me uh, yeah, yeah. before I left for LA to tell me you were going back to do the uh, outtakes, and you said, "Are you available?" And I was uh, going out to work with Pat Benatar, and I couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was what, uh, what studio were you working in the record plant with John? Did he have a favorite mix room? room. Now I'll tell you a funny, funny, kind of a strange story. When when Yoko asked me to do the the stripped down version of it, um, I wanted the best A to D converters that there were you know were in town to to transfer all of that material. And um, I think it was Jay who said probably Sony Battery would have the best stuff. I didn't know Sony Battery was over at three twenty one West Forty Fourth. I called them and I said, it's not your client, but I'd like to come in to do the transfers. And they said, well, you know, we're on the 10th floor at 321. So I thought, wow, that's so <laughs> weird that I would be going back there to do this. And they said, well, it's even stranger because the room you would be doing it in, oh, right. the last room you worked with him in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, because wow. the transfers were done in what was the mix room. Right. So Jay and I went back to the mix room and started working on that record exactly where I left off. It was, uh, oh, God. right, Jay? It was kind of yeah, you know, it was spooky. Surreal, yeah, spooky, yeah. Did you go up to the roof? I think I did. I brought my daughter up there oh, one day. They, they, have, they have this thing called, the you know, the Lennon Vault. Remember the Lennon Vault? Yeah, sure. It's, it's like showcase now. It says Lennon Vault, and there's all flowers and tables, and it's like a, a place that you can rent for a party. Wow, <laughs> oh, pretty interesting. Yeah. So, Ed, you were you were working in town at, in the seventies, and all these guys with the, at the record plant. Yeah, I'm the I'm definitely the odd man out here because I was never on staff at record plant. As a matter of fact, I only worked at record plant in Manhattan once. Um, but I'm a fan. I'm the fanboy here, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> where were you? <clears throat> in Jersey. You know, I was playing, and these guys were, you know, all starting out at A and R and record plant, and I was uh, in bands playing, you know, bars, and but I was always interested in recording. Um, and you know, when Electric Lady came out, and looking through the credits, and you know, was that's when I think the first studio credit I really noticed was record plant. Um, didn't Electric Lady come out in um, Electric Lady Land? Uh, came out in '68. Uh, I thought it came out in November of '68. Now was record plant. Yeah, have... it was there. That's where they. That's where they did it. They yeah. did it in A, the old A room. Okay, that's right. That's right. I, I didn't know that at the time, but when I started seeing credits and seeing Record Plant, and then especially when uh, something anything came out, uh, Todd Rundgren's uh, double album and Tide Four recorded in A. Yes. Yeah, and they had all that big uh, spread. Uh, yeah. Fold out thing, and they, there were Record Plant track sheets on there. I was interested in recording, but you know, I, I had been in a couple studios in Manhattan. We did demos at Allegro when I was in a band in like '69, and at, um, what's another place? Dick Charles, Dick Charles Studios. You know, oh yeah. I don't even have copies of that. So I have copies of the Allegro stuff, and uh, I was always interested in it, but I never really delved into it. I was a band guy. I was the band guy that had a tape recorder in one hand and 
you know, guitar in the other hand and always recorded the band. So, um, but when Todd's record came out and I saw the track sheet, I've never seen a track sheet for record play. I'm there, God, I got it. And I just, you know, then you know, Three Dog Night stuff and the Raspberry stuff and um, all the stuff that, you know, uh, Jack did and Shelly and I'm like, oh man, this is, this is what I want to do somehow. And somehow through a friend of mine, I got uh, introduced to a, in Jersey, this guy named Tony Camello. Yeah, Tony. Oh, yeah. yeah Tony. Those partners. Yeah, Tony. Tony Bon Jovi, who had yeah. been at, briefly been at Record Plant, I believe, before he went to, he was at Apostolic, then he went to uh, Record Plant, then to Media Sound. At the time I met Tony Bon Jovi and Tony Camello, um, Tony was at Media. And um, we were doing a record with uh, Tony. So I just met, I met a friend of mine, and he said, a friend of my dad's is building a studio in, uh, in New Jersey in his basement, basically. Tony Camello had built out his basement and he had a, uh, was putting in a recording studio. I'm there, like, I'm there. Uh, previous, right previous to this, I had been in a band that went to Chicago. We got signed to Brunswick Records and uh, went to uh, Brunswick Recording Studios. Jackie and Wilson. Bruce, and Bruce Swedeen had designed the studio. And mm -hmm. Bruce Swedeen uh, was the engineer. On, on the record. And that's when I really got interested because he was showing me the patch bay. There was an Ampex MM1000 there with the 16 track. And, you know, he let me touch the console and show me what the EQ did. And I'm there, oh, this is where I'm going, hopefully. I didn't know how <laughs> I was going to get there, but I bumped into my friend, Michael Bonagoro, who I played in bands with. His dad taught um, English at the same uh, college in New Jersey, uh, was on the white college in the Zarephus, um, that Tony Camello was a music professor. And Tony was building the studio in conjunction with Bon Jovi um, in Somerville, New Jersey. And I started hanging out there. When I walked in there, everything was on the floor. A Langevin four-track console uh, that was converted from a 12-track to a 16-track. And it was an MM1000 in there. And I just helped wire the place and get it all together. And um, my first, I was very excited. We, were, we did an album with Ben Vereen. Um, huh. He, cool. was, he was a Broadway. He was in Pippin. I forgot he was in. Oh, yeah. yeah. He, he won, got an Emmy. Was it Emmy? No, no. What's that? Broadway? Tony. Tony. Yeah, that's it. Tony um, for Pippin. And Tony Camello had a tight. Um, a lot of Tonys. A lot of Tonys going on. Hey, <laughs> a lot of Tonys happening here. <laughs> and uh, Tony was tight with uh, Neil Bogart at Buddha. And so he got all these gigs with Buddha. And, and I, I believe uh, right. ben Green was on the Buddha label. And Gladys Knight was on there. That's when we did the Gladys stuff. And uh, my first uh, journey into record plant, it was like, oh my God, it was like a devout Catholic going to St. Paul's Cathedral. I was like, oh my God, I'm here. I'm at record plant. And we, we recorded Ben Vereen tap dancing in Studio A. That's all I did there. <laughs> <laughs> what might you use? <laughs> on the hardwood floor. I recorded it in stereo as well. I two, I two eighty seven. <laughs> Yeah, and that too, we did it on 16 track, and that was a um, one for each foot. Yeah, and that's <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and uh, you know, Tony was out of the room, and uh, I wanted a job at Record Plant. So I, Roy, you know, hey, you know, I'm, I'm starting out in this, but I'd love to work here. I'll do anything. I'll get in here. He says, well, you know, let me know. Give me a call once in a while. Okay, I'll give him a call. I'm working. I'm, I think I was still collecting unemployment and working for Camelo for nothing at this particular juncture. And um, then uh, the earliest records we did at Camelo's, uh, I didn't know anything about mastering or cutting. And um, right after that, um, Roy, Roy told me about the cutting room upstairs, which is when I met Mr. Calby. And, and then I, I started cutting all of the Camelo stuff uh, with Greg. And that's how our relationship started there. But uh, it's funny that the only okay. thing I ever recorded at Record Plant was Ben Vereen frickin' tap. <laughs> <laughs> Ed, was that uh, House of Music? Uh, was that the name of the place? No, I didn't yeah, work at it. Music. It was called Venture Sound. House of Music was up north. That's right. Yeah. There was a fellow named Stefan Galfis that worked House of Music, I believe. Was that his oh, name? Oh, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's, there's, oh, yeah, there's yeah, a whole yeah. story there. Yeah. Charlie Conrad at House of Music. Yeah. Yeah. That's, That's it. Oh. Irene. Yeah. Didn't they rent the great people, Apex man. Oral Exciter? Didn't they rent that out, remember? Oh, yeah. I rented I, I actually fell for that. Paid per song or something like that. It was a minute. Yeah, I remember minute, doing, right, right. after leaving Camelos and I went up to uh, the studio more in Heights for a year in Canon staff. When I came back, um, I, uh, Tony, again, Tony Bon Jovi came in and uh, 
I, um, I was actually, he asked me to come back from Canada to start a power station with him, uh, with, you know, with Bobby and uh, Ed Evans. And I was the first person actually on staff for the power station. Mm. And uh, I was doing a lot of work at Media Sound as well. And uh, the Aphex thing came into effect there and you had to pay. And you know, I think it was a big thing and it was an LA thing. I think Ronstadt used it on a couple of her records with Val Garay. And you had, you had to put their logo on the on the uh, album jacket. You had, oh, to give yeah, them- right. you had to pay by the minute. By the minute, that's right, Jack. <laughs> Freaking minute. Like a meter. Yeah. <laughs> you just came to that stuff minute. when you got to mastering, it was awful. Oh. Really? <laughs> you know how many people had a remix because they didn't hear on their speakers that there was this high end going on. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, wow. That was well, amazing. Maybe heard it but you, though, Shelly. What's that? It's possible you're the only one that heard that. <laughs> <laughs> you know. hey, hey, since we're live, guys, on this Facebook thing, we got a couple of questions in. Uh, Facebook thing. We got, I'm going to read you three of them, okay? First one is for Shelly. How were the guitars on Damn the Torpedoes recorded? Second one is for Jack. Some stories about the New York Dolls. Third is not a question, but also Paul Prestopino is looking to join the Zoom. Should we let him in? Oh, kidding? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so get so, about it. He's yeah. one of the dolls in Peter, Paul, and Mary. So first one is <laughs> guitars He's on them, the torpedoes. Ed, Mike Bonagora. There's a Mike Bonagora down here. Maybe his son? That's him. That's Michael. That's, that's him. Yeah, that's him. It, uh, Bailey and the boys. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, his daughter is kind of an artist now. Alyssa, Alyssa is amazing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Hey. Honorary niece. Huh? My honorary niece. Oh, cool. That's cool. Yeah. Go ahead. You, you, guitars on them, the torpedoes. Any recollection of recording them? Yeah. Um, how were they recorded? Yeah. Very well. <laughs> no, no, no. you know you know those mike campbell has a great sound to start with it's it you got to try to screw it up you know to screw it up but i i remember that these guys would uh, choose the amp they wanted the guitar they wanted usually we put the amp up off the floor a little bit either on a couple of blocks of wood or on a chair just to get rid of some of the mud and we'd use a I would use uh, two or three mics on, on an amp, you know. I probably have a direct box hooked up and listen and see if that sounded any good. But a lot of times it was uh, there were two speakers in the amps that they used, and I used a, a, a different mic. AC thirties, Shelley. Box. Yeah, they had those, and they had uh, yes, they had those, and they had other types of amps um, across across the board, you know. Michael Mike Campbell would do his the demos at, at home and they were tough to beat. But the uh, I remember using three mics where I would take the left speaker on an amp, the right speaker on an amp, put it to two separate tracks and a middle mic that I put between the speakers. It was not on a speaker, but on the grill cloth and put that between the two tracks so that it wasn't just a guitar on one track. It was a guitar on on two tracks and because it even though the amp had the same thing coming out of both speakers the two mics made it sound like it had it was stereo because it was the frequency response was different uh, so by uh, using that middle by using three mics ooh. probably a this probably a room mic about five feet away and a little bit of that um and prop and that was probably blended in the middle we just tried to we just tried to capture what they were doing which was they had a they had a way of tuning the guitars. This may sound odd because I I never really understood it, but they had a way of tuning their guitars that they would never discuss, and um, oh. it it gave it it gave their guitars a sound that when they played with Ben Mont's organ and the bass, it just made this sound that was like like. Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, and I, I know I know this sounds strange about the tuning, but they did something. They they just did something different with the tuning, even though it was in tune. They got the strings to uh, to make this sound that was very cool. Wow, incredible! Wow. So, Shelly, uh, can I ask you, can I ask Shelly a question for a second? 
Yeah. I always remember Shelly being in B and not in A as much. Shelly, did you like the room? Did you like the sound of B, the room, better than A? Or is it just my imagination? My memory is whenever I work with you, it was usually in B. Especially Jack, with was, Jack and Jay were always hogging A, so I couldn't. <laughs> yeah, but you like the API board. Yes. Uh, all, wow. kidding, all kidding aside. I B like was it. just easier for Shelly to run, run out. <laughs> <laughs> It was closer I, to I the like, refrigerator. I, I like working in three. I was very comfortable. Like Presto! Where is he? There he is. Hey, Paul. What are we listening to here? Hear us. See us. That yeah. figures the maintenance man can't we is having a problem. Hear that. Exactly. What are we listening to here? <laughs> You can turn it up, Presto. Oh, Presto. Feedback. See us. Wow. We're getting feedback. Not the, analog guy. not the kind of feedback we're looking for. What's in his eyes? Oh, there's the screen. <laughs> <laughs> feedback. All right, we let Presto in. Let's throw Mark Antonio out. <laughs> not the kind of feedback we're looking for. What's in his eyes? <laughs> Paul, turn down the volume on the thing. Paul, turn down the volume on the, what do you call on the Shavis. Turn it down. <laughs> or kill the Facebook feed. Turn down what volume? Oh, dear. Paul, turn We're... down the volume on the thing. Paul, turn down the volume on the, what do you call on the Shavis. Turn it down. <laughs> oh, the candle down. <laughs> Turn off Facebook. Turn off the feed of Facebook. Turn down the volume on the thing. Turn down the volume on the. This is our technical. Uh... Why does this not surprise me? Right. Hey. <laughs> Hey, so oh, he, he, Presto, fix it. Uh, maybe this wasn't a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! This where's, is where's, where's Jimmy? Get in here, Jimmy. Fix it, will you? Uh, cut the Facebook. Everyone, cut the Facebook. You have Facebook? Are you watching Facebook, Paul Presapino? I think so, but I'm not sure. Now, fix it, will you? That's what we're doing. He's got Facebook on. He's watching this in Facebook. Yeah, Facebook. Are you watching Facebook, Paul Presapino? I think so. Yes. Paul, you want me to come over there and fix it for you? That's what we're doing. He's got Facebook on. He's watching this in Facebook. No, believe me. I think we, we need to mute Paul. Yeah. Yes. Yes. There you go. Okay. Oh shit. All right. What the fuck? You can watch. Oh. <laughs> Someone should call him and let him know. Just go to a Zoom and bada bing. Yeah. Bada bing. So, so just quickly. So the doll, Jack. Yeah. You wake up, yeah, Jack. <laughs> that that knocked you out. Um, so um did you work with Jay with the dolls? Well, on the comeback album, but on the very uh, first album. We got Jack. <laughs> oh, I worked with you on that, Jack. On the on the first album. Um, on the first. Oh, hey, Johnny. John and Yellow. So the first album uh, we did for Mercury in and uh, I don't know what year it was. Seventy one, maybe. About that, yeah. Seventy two. 72, I think. Oh. And so uh, Todd Rockman was the producer. Uh, we did some... uh, not a good, not a good match, really. Wow. Because Todd liked like harmonies and he liked things that were clean and produced and and um, uh, while we were recording it, you know, Jimmy Iveen was also my assistant on that. And uh, while we were while we were doing it, like the band would be out there playing Personality Crisis or Trash or whatever, mm -hmm. and he would be sitting next to me, and he would say, "God, this is awful." <laughs> <laughs> and then pretty soon he stopped showing up, and he would call in, "How's it going? I'm I got a few things to do," 
and and it was like now the 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 lunatics were running the asylum. Oh shit! <laughs> and it was just the band and myself, Jimmy, or I mean, I, when it happened that he decided he wasn't going to show up, it was uh, um, we were doing one of those songs. I think Personality Crisis, and David Johansson was in a booth singing a ref for the band, and David came in and. Todd was already complaining about how terrible it was. <laughs> David came in and Todd said to him, you know, that's going to sound really good when we put like harmony on it. And <laughs> David looked at him and he said, harmony? Are you accusing me of having melody? <laughs> <laughs> he was, he was kind of taking the piss out of him, but, <laughs> but Todd didn't take it like that. He took it seriously. And so... Todd started not showing up and we would have to run all this interference for like the label, the label Mercury would like, what's going on? Oh, it's all good. Well, can we <laughs> come up to the studio? And we'd go, how about if, um, if David comes down and meets you, because we're so busy, we, we had to keep the place locked because they, we didn't want them to know how crazy it was, but we got, we managed to get it done. Todd came in, we mixed the whole album in about four days, basically just, all done in C. Basically, we just put the faders up and and um, got a balance, and and that's what went down uh, onto the two track. And David Krebs was the manager, and um, and he said, "Look, we knew you know what was going on up there, and somehow you managed to get a record out of it, <laughs> you know, even though there was it was crazy." So he said, "Here's the here's what's going on. We have a baby band that we also managed that you." might want to take a look at Bob Ezrin said, you know, you're probably the guy to do this. So my reward for holding that dolls thing together was uh, uh, Aerosmith. Yep. And so, and then now many years later, wow. um, I guess that was 2011, Jay, or 10, no, before, five. before that, about five or six, 2005 yeah, six. or six, there was a comeback album and, um, and Jay and I did that. And it's a, it's a really, really good album. I'm very proud of it. Um, great lyrics, great tunes. The, the Dolls Comeback album it did was the uh, Rolling Stones list of the, the 10 best albums of the year for what that's worth. It sold, you know, like uh, maybe three copies, but <laughs> it doesn't matter. It, you know, it, they were able to tour and, and, it, was, and it was great. But, um, Working with them is very interesting because uh, uh, David is a uh, he's a brilliant man. Yeah. Actually, he's yeah. very smart. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, and I j was just involved uh, with David and uh, Martin Scorsese. We did a film about David, and uh, yes, right. It's in post now. I believe. Uh, Stuart, you work on that? No, I didn't. I didn't. But. Uh... But I know David and Scorsese have been involved. You know, he did the blues thing. David worked on. Yeah, Jay and I. I oh know I was involved with that. Right. I got to meet Marty, and that's. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know, and Jack. Coincidentally, yeah. Stuart's reward for holding the podcast together is doing more podcasts with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can show up late, and like it's cool. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but then the second Dolls record you did with Jay? And the, the comeback album I did with Jay, yeah. We did it We did uh, at, a, at a studio over on, uh, on, on Third Avenue, I believe, up on the, in a brownstone tenement building. That was quite good. Well, the stuff that you and Jay did together was fabulous. Thank you, Shelley. Yeah, fabulous Thank sound, you. fabulous production. I loved it. Yep. So, so Jack, how did you make the move from engineer to producer. Was that a uh, Bob Ezrin talked me into it. Um, I was working on those Alice Cooper records with him and, um, and he knew what I had done with the dolls that, you know, actually I was kind of producing it. And he said to me, you know, you're doing a producer's job a lot of the time with a lot of your clients who come in. Why don't you start producing and come, come join my company, which was uh, Nimbus. Based in Toronto, and I had um, 
I had a dual citizen, not dual citizenship, but a landed immigrant status in, in uh, Canada because I paid, played in Canadian bands in the mid sixties. So um, I was able to go up there and do and work and uh, because of CanCon, Canadian content, I was considered Canadian if I did it, even though I'm from the Bronx. But uh, so I started working as a producer for his company, did a couple of records. And then uh, when it was time for the last group Alice Cooper album, which was Muscle of Love, he said to me, I, you know, this is the last group album. I'm not uh, fond of being at um, funerals. So I would like you to do the record. And uh, we did that one at Sunset Sound and, and Record Plant New York. And Record Plant Sausalito. We moved around a lot for that one. Were there producers that you um, up to at that point or that you learned from? Yeah, I mean, when, all the time that I was assisting or producing, I was, I was keeping a book on what worked and, and, uh, and what didn't work. And so, um, you know, I really kept trying. I liked a lot of what Bob uh, did. You know, he, he played way out of his league all the time. He faked it when he couldn't. But it was, you know, he could really sell a fake really well. Um, but I worked with uh, with a, a lot of producers, uh, and um, I kept book. Um, I mean, you know, uh, the, you know, the guy producing the Who, he, the, the theatrical thing he had going, you know, where he would he would be working the lights as they played. Uh, was, and, that light, was that the Lifehouse project? Yeah, well, yeah, it was. Yeah, it turned into Who's Next. Is that Kit yeah. Lambert? Kit Lambert, yeah. Yeah. Kit Lambert, who, when we finished it, we did two weeks uh, at Record Plant. And uh, and the band would take me out every night. They, they uh, like at midnight, they would say, meet at the this hotel on Central Park West, the Navarro, I think it was called. And they had the whole ninth floor of that... Uh, of that hotel, it was a small, it was a boutique hotel, and and uh, Kit and uh, Keith Moon and and um, what's his name, guitar player, uh, Pete Townsend. Yeah, Pete Townsend. They had the front two suites facing the park on the ninth floor, and we would meet in Pete's suite, and then we would go out. But every night we would meet there. Um, Keith Moon would never come in the door; he would come through the window. Which meant that he would <laughs> walk out. He climb out on the ledge, open Pete's window. This is the ninth floor, a high ninth floor, and then climb in Pete's window. And everyone in the room would think that was totally okay. <laughs> <laughs> Except for me, you know, they would just go, "Hey, Pete. I mean, hey, Pete, how you doing? Okay, you know, it was a tiny little ledge." I <laughs> Bruce Springsteen once walked on the ledge of, of uh, the record plant tenth floor for quite a long distance. Right. And those top pieces yeah. were loose. Too. Yeah. Yeah. And they were curved, right? Or yeah, they, they were curved. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway. Do we have Paul yet? I think he's still muted. Yes, he is. Those top yeah, pieces yeah. Were loose. Unmuted. Yeah. There he is. Hey, there he is. Right? Or yeah, they were curved. Hello? Paul, oh, yeah. Paul? Supposedly. Nah, we got you. Still muted. Yeah, there you go. Muted. Unmuted. Yeah. Unmuted. There he is. Hey, there he is. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Hello? Oh, it's kind of good psychedelic again. He's still yeah. monitoring Facebook. All right, mute him again. <laughs> <laughs> That's unbelievable. So we never heard how John got started at Record Plan. Right. Yes, John, do tell. John who? You. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, well, when I was younger as a kid, I worked at Eventide during the summers, my summer job. And then in college, I was kind of burnt out of college after the second year. And then uh, I guess Robert got me the interview with Paul Sloman. And then Sloman said, if you're anything like your brother, or you, if you're half as good as your brother, you'll be fine. Some, some bullshit like that. And then they hired me and then I became a tape librarian. 
And funny about Roy, Roy threw me out of my first assisting uh, controller, the mixer. <laughs> Because I basically, he was all set up for something and I showed up and I thought it was not neat. So I kind of pulled all the patch cords and oh. <laughs> everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not that neatness was not next to godliness. And he came in and within 20 minutes, he picked up the phone and he was like, Lila. Um, he said something like, you know, this kid's an idiot. Um, <laughs> Steve Mark Antonio or anybody else. So I got thrown out of the room, went to the tape library, started crying. And then Dave Hewitt came in. And he said, what's the matter, John? And I was, I told him the story. <laughs> like, me fine. And I was like, really? And I was like, yeah. So, and that was it. I, you know, he, he threw me out. I learned my lesson. And uh, I ended up, you know, a year, years later, assisting for him a bunch. And, you know, he did the whole fucked up thing with me with the uh, foot pedal, with the output of the console, where he would be mixing. And he like, hey, tap the side of the console. And I tap it and the level would go down. <laughs> and he did this to me for half an hour. And then he had me call maintenance and have them come up. And they came up and I was just like, you know, it was like, clearly I was just an idiot, you know, and uh, <laughs> that was it. But I, I worked, you know, with Jack and Rod a bunch early on. In fact, Jack and Rod were at my first, uh, uh, my first wedding. Jack and Rod came into Bensonhurst to the cuisine Kuj wedding mm -hmm. <laughs> and totally ran amok. <laughs> like, we did um, not. Like, as bad as our Christmas parties or not oh, as bad? Way worse, because they were surrounded by cougines. You know? <laughs> and, and like Jack and Christine, I, I just remember my mother saying, you know, your friend Jack's wife was talking to Uncle Charlie, but it was a little funny. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, but then anyway, so I did a bunch of records like that. And then, then I started working with Whitman and then when women started producing, they threw me into the engineering thing. But really quick, Steve turned. Uh, Steve told me how to be an assistant. Like I learned. Oh, so the that was the problem. Exactly. <laughs> that's, why my, that's why my mother thinks I'm a loser. Yeah, but your mother, your mother <laughs> kind of likes the fact that we gave you money for the cab because you yeah, used to fall asleep on the train. She's brilliant. She never forgets. Hey, my mother is so mad at the woman that fun. died 19 years ago in the neighborhood. About this thing she said, the woman said to her like 19 years ago, she's been dead for like 18 years. My mother still won't let that go. <laughs> anyway, you know, but that, it was, it was, you know, I think I started engineering in 84. It was fantastic. So, yeah. in fact, the Hooters record, it's just like the 35th anniversary or something. 40. Really? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, it's crazy. I mean, but I worked with all you guys. You know, I didn't assist Ed, but I, you know, I assisted for Jay a bunch and I assisted for Jack and Shelly. I, I remember doing Tom moves over Shelly's shoulders for, I think, a meet over there. <laughs> that was scary. You and I have an orange peel fight across the console. We were throwing uh, <laughs> oranges. I don't know. You were very kind to me. That's all I'll Bill say. Bill Whitman used to shoot uh, the, 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 through a straw, the sharpened toothpicks and shoot them at John. And, and, and clubs. It, he had a thing that he used to stick them in the chairs and he called them the Bengalese tiger traps. <laughs> <laughs> Down and you'd be like, yo! Bill Whitman, you know, I worked in B, you know, and you, you would be facing the machine, not facing the, like, if you were, if you were looking at the machine ready to punch in, you were, had your back to the engineer. So, and he was listening loud. And as soon as I punch in, he would solve the kick truck. Yeah. yeah. And that feeling, that feeling, your your heart just drops. You think you erased everything. You know? <laughs> um, Did you guys ever work with Dennis Ferranti? Yeah, Dennis oh, yeah. was my assistant a lot. He used to do an imitation of a fly. It was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I miss Dennis. I missed a lot of stuff. You know, Jack, when me and Sharon saw a Cheap Trick in October, um, and I did the photo thing with them. And they, you know, uh, they were talking about you. And I said, you know, that I know you forever. I, I missed those records at the record plant by like two or three years. And it sucked because I was such a huge fan, you know. Yeah. But well, I did we just, work with you on an Aerosmith record, which was fantastic. Yeah. We just did a, uh, we just did a, a new single with Cheap Turk. I did it. Oh, wow. Should be out pretty soon. I don't know. Okay. They um, were great live. They were yeah, so great live. Uh, Jack, yeah. do you remember the night they opened up at Max's? I do absolutely. I arranged. Nobody, that. nobody knew who they were. Well, now here's the thing. 
I wanted Cheap Trick to tour, to open for Aerosmith, but you could never ask Aerosmith to do you a favor like that. They, they were, as yeah. far as that went, they were assholes. They would never do you that kind of favor. Although, you know, my son is in the band now, Colin. But, but aside from that, they wouldn't do you that kind of favor. So what I did was I arranged them to play at Max's and I invited two guys from Kiss, uh, Gene and uh, the other guy. Paul. Paul. Gene and Paul, I invited them to come to the show. So Gene and Paul came to the show. Cheap Trick was incredible. Of course, they were always incredible. They were just amazing on stage. They played for like three hours. Yeah. Uh, uh, Gene threw a $100 bill up on the stage. And Rick, Nielsen, Rick Nielsen ate it. <laughs> <laughs> and Gene called me over and he said, these guys have got to open for us. <clears throat> because if they open for Kiss, Aerosmith would come to me and say, hey, how come they're not opening for us? You know, you're a friend. What's going on? So they did a tour with Kiss, and then they did a million tours with Aerosmith. And that was uh -oh. yeah. that's how that happened. That was my, my shenanigans there. Always that was great. Tour. That was a great show, though, that night at Max's. Oh, I was. I have some wonderful pictures from that show. I just remember uh, Rick. Rick had like a 50 foot guitar cable and yeah. went down this, went down this, the, the tables. Remember the tables used to come out from the stage yeah. and he just kicking drinks left and right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Hey, we so, got any more questions? Well, uh, I got a couple, but just, is everyone working during this time or is like, what's well, going actually, on? If I could do a plug, Jay and I are about to accept, uh, mixes online uh so we'll be working together on mixes online and uh, you could contact us at u-n-k-l-e-r-e-m-i-x one at gmail uncle remix at gmail.com wow, that's a great idea very cool and steve and steve and you're something right say what you're doing something now aren't you yeah. online I'm doing something actually, well, besides, I've got a few mixes I'm doing too for some friends. Uh, but I started this thing on Facebook called Pro Tools Basics because there are uh, <clears throat> some of the, the, there's a lot of musicians I know here in town that are on the road with artists and they're, you know, they're hurting for work and also they're not used to working at home anymore. So some people are don't know how to do the simple things in Pro Tools. So I'm doing something live on Facebook for for Pro Tools because I'm I got in good with Avid. I know a lot of people there now, and uh, it's interesting. And everyone's very um, thankful that that I'm doing that because you know it's we got to get music out out right now. A lot of these people are at home. They want to get their music out. We need music right now during these times for sure. For sure. And I just make something for you, Stuart, and that's all your. You guys, John and yeah, yeah. Jake and Tony, and it was great. Well, if you don't mind, I'll do a little shameless self promotion. <laughs> <laughs> who are you? Who am I? Yeah, who? So I, I have a website, uh, Shelly Yakastad Info, and I'm going to be doing um, some Facebook Live stuff where uh, I do some question and answer, tales from the crypt, you nice. know, stories from the crypt. I'm also going to be doing, um, uh, if you follow me on Instagram, Shelly Yakis, uh, I'm also going to be doing, doing some um, uh, uh, classes for uh, how, to, how to make a better sounding home studio, how to improve your sound, how to, nice. how to uh, just make better sounding finished music from, from my point of view, you know. Cool. And uh, let's see, let me, in the name of shamelessness, let me just make sure I've got it in there. <laughs> so, uh, how to create your best sound anywhere. And, we'll, and I'm going to do it on Zoom, on Facebook, and uh, live question and answer, and the schedule's on my, on my, uh, on my site. Okay, and let's I, just keep Presto away from that, okay? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Great, Shelly. So, you know, uh, I know Rod does is in the film world what's going on in that world now is like are you doing post-production or 
They're tr we're trying to do a little bit at a time. Um, we still have guys editing, you know, sound effects and dialogue and stuff at home. But, you know, the show I was doing or that I was working on was shooting in New York. That's completely shut down. Right. But we had uh, seven or eight episodes shot. So they're trying to do something with it. But, you know, we can't get actors to come in and do ADR or... And right. so, you know, it's creeping along, but I don't really care. <laughs> I was, uh, I was in the I'm middle just hanging out talking to you guys. I, know, I was in the middle of scoring a film and I was very excited about it. It's a great film. I was over in England on set, came back, started to writing the score out and the whole thing got shut down. Damn. Yeah. What was the score at the time when you shut it down? <laughs> hey, by the way, Rod, great and Frankie. Sorry, Jack. Do me a softball. I mean, I'll... you got to jump on them, Jack. By the way, hey, Rod, uh, yeah. there's about, I'd say there's maybe a half a dozen uh, Atmos rooms now here in town. Yeah, I saw that uh, McBride put in uh, in the Massenburg. Yeah, yeah, UMG is doing, I, I'm not sure all their catalog, but they're doing a whole bunch. Yeah. I don't know if anybody else out there has uh, heard Atmos or done anything Atmos. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah it's it's great. A little better than Q Sound. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Most I've heard one or two of those, but not many. Yeah. No, so, it's uh, it looks like it's going to stay both in the music business and in the post world because uh, was it Universal and somebody else? Is it Warner Brothers that's doing their catalog in Atmos too? Yeah, Warner Brothers is starting to do it, and uh, Universal is yeah. doing a lot of it. Uh, Nico, yeah. doing a lot of the work. Oh right, Nico. Yes, Nico yeah. and I are pretty good friends, and and Amazon made a, a bar, a sound bar that's for Atmos. There's a couple of sound bars you can buy for home, one of which is, I think the cheapest one is about $1,200. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's it's not perfect, but it's, you know, it's great. I mean, it's, it's a real, the funny thing is I talked to the guys at Dolby when it first came out, and one of the things they said to me was, yeah, you could do Star Wars with, you know, with the spaceships going around and all that. But some of the best stuff is just like, when you're immersed in it, because unlike regular surround, these are full fidelity speakers all the way. You know, if, you know, um, you get full range speakers all around. Yeah, you know, so, it's funny. I, I watch movies. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I listen in Dolby Atmos. I, the whole experience Here you go. is incredible. <laughs> Dolby at most. <laughs> hey, you know, hey, Stuart, one thing before I, I get a chance is that I, I'm sure I know I, at least people that follow me on Facebook, th th these people are going to watch this today. And even a lot of kids, the younger kids, they're going to watch this. Uh, I, there's a, a drummer here in town, Chris McHugh. He's badass. He loves the drums. His favorite drum sounds are from the Aerosmith records. I think he even spoke to Jay. So, I, I mean, everything we're talking about, I think a lot of people are going to tap into this because I think there still is hope that this younger generation still wants to make records with the care that we gave them. Yeah. You know, um, so. I, I agree with you. You know, my daughter said to me, you know, she said, Dad, you know, you, you've been doing this for a lot of years and people, you know, like your sounds and why don't you go online and show them how to get the sounds you got on records you did and and uh, I'm not the best self promoter but uh, she talked me into doing this and I and I, I agree with you that all of us here we have such great real life experience to be able to pass it on and to be able to to uh, still work and 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 create and I think we all bring something to the table that's a lot of people don't bring to the table and maybe would like to find out about. But besides that, I, I feel like we all we all have this unique experience and this approach that we learned from in the day that that really works and and and, and created records that stand the test of time. You know. Yep. Amen. I'm tearing up. And, uh, and Johnny, oh, Johnny, you're sitting down there working as we speak, right? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I, I am not really. 
<laughs> Looks like I'm working. I know. Um, I found a place in the woods in Graham, North Carolina, that's like a barn that has, you know, that I just have a bunch of stuff. It's It's got, you know. Oh, it's, nice. It's a good vibe, but it's really yeah. like, it's out. And uh, the owner, Max, it's called Dark Pines. And the owner, Max, just, you know, I come in, he lets me in. I just leave and uh, it's, it's, it's kind of the, uh, a, it's a very good quarantine studio because it's just me. And, um, um, you know, the artist is in Amherst, Massachusetts, Dinosaur Jr. And we're going back and forth on the phones and that's for two weeks. And then I'm mixing a female singer's record after that here. So it turns out I'm kind of busy. It's weird, you know, it's a weird time to kind of have work, but I'm, you know, it's fine. I'm great, it's good. Awesome. Great. So yeah, I got lucky. Does anyone know of the commercial studios that are open? I mean, that's a private studio, right? It's not really a. Yeah. My yeah. son runs uh, uh, United in LA. They're open. They yeah. are open. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, just, I, I called Blackbird last two weeks ago, and they didn't seem like they were shut down, Steve, right? They're, they're open, right? No, they're, they're all, they all have to shut down. They're shut down. Oh, they're shut down now. I think they might open soon. Right. Like even this week, I think they're opening. Right. In, yeah. uh, in LA, a lot of studios are not advertising that they're open. That's. But they're doing, like, if you have somebody like John that they know, I don't know why they let him in, but um, he know, they're, like, they're letting, like, you know, they're, they're letting a couple of people to come in, but it's very minimal amounts. Yeah, you have to stay out in a different room and that, you know, yeah, yeah. that's what, that's what uh, my son said. Yeah. United's not advertising they're open. No, no. There are clients who want to do their vocals and. So that's yeah. what's going on. And they yeah, and they'll come, they'll get out of the car, go right in, into a yeah. vocal booth or whatever, do their thing, boom, done, finished. That's, yeah, that's what but you're doing. With everything being so different, might there be a subsequent, like, sound that comes out of this little era that where people are making music differently? I mean, no one's in a room together playing, but everyone is still kind of, uh, carrying on in the best way they can, but will there wind up being somewhat of a different sound from this? Um, it may not be uh, better. Yeah, no, but, we'll know in a, we'll know in a few months. Yeah, right. but I think it's I think it's already happening, Jack. I mean, you know, people are doing more and more stuff remotely. Like you guys are talking about mixing online, and there yeah. are guy and you can you can go online now and say, hey, listen, I need a guitar part from so and so contact them, send them a, a, a session, and they send it back. Oh, yeah. It's already happened. Yeah. yeah. Anton fig has been doing remote drums from his house for years. Yeah. yeah. Aronoff's doing it as well. Kenny Aronoff. Yeah. Kenny oh, yeah. 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 But I mean, yeah, there's nothing like, um, like going back to when we were in, you, me, and Jay were sitting there watching those five guys from Boston in the same room. Yeah, you know, every once in a while we just sort of sit sit up and go, "Wow, that was amazing." Yeah, a lot of times we said no, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> too many times we went, uh, "I don't know." Yeah, that sucks. <laughs> now, we'll it cut again. it together. <laughs> Jack, your point about how it, that it might not be better or not—it almost sounds like it's like a producerless era in a way. Even though you guys, when you're going to mix something, you'll put your touch on it, but as people are recording there's really not another person in the room to help guide the ship. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, and, and I know, Jay, we talked about this audio movers thing, right? Has mm -hmm. anyone checked that out where you can kind of lock into, you, you have, Steve. Game changer. Tell us about it, because I, I have Actually, I'm, 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 I need another, um... My friend Glenn Rosenstein, I'm, you might know Glenn. Yeah. Ed, but yeah. uh, he gave me an online thing, and I'm going to do it again with him. But he was engineering a vocal here in Nashville from a singer in Connecticut with the producer in L.A. Oh. Through Audio Movers. And he said it worked fine. So it's a so, plug-in you just put in your session, and you're communicating with everybody. Yeah, I, I, and I'm not sure... I'm not sure if you need Zoom to go through it or not. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure about that. 
But I will. I do know there's programs out there already where you can communicate and do th stuff live. And I think mm -hmm. after this situation we're in now, there's going to be even better programs because people are probably working on them right now. Well, what about the latency? How does that? How does the latency? Well, there, I, I, I don't know about the latency. I know that I they have a plugin that you put on your master fader, and you can send someone a link, and they can listen to it. I know that you know there's probably a two second delay there. But when Glenn was talking about doing the punches. I'm not sure if there was like maybe milliseconds delay, you know, so there was a little latency, but not enough, you know, to uh, matter. Well, you know, like I said before, I was doing the show that was shooting in New York. Right. And we were posting it in L.A. and we did a thing with a program called Source Connect. Well, that's the new audio movers. Yeah. Similar. And, yeah. and there we would do ADR against picture. And wow. I would say the latency was less than two two milliseconds if it was set up correctly. Wow! Um, and we would we would be able to you know like watch the video in L.A., hear somebody in New York or wherever, and go, yeah, that's that's in sync. That'll work. You know, that's the right performance, etc. Now, granted, we were doing short pieces like a, one sentence or two right. sentences long. But the, the latency was was great. Now the, the program's not cheap. It's probably I think it's twenty five hundred bucks, mm. but it's kind of like an ISDN line. It's but you don't need that, and you're not paying per minute, um, and um, it works great. Problem is you, you know now we can't use it because the, you know the actors are in their home. Right. So, right. But there's studios in New York and L.A. and you've I've had I've done it in South America and, and mm -hmm. Europe. Same thing. Very little latency. It's set up correctly. Oh, let's hope we don't have to do it too much longer. Yeah, it will be interesting to see how this all. Uh, what, what, what? As long as we all stick tight and stay tight until it's absolutely right for us to go. Yeah, right on. Right yeah. Yes. I think, you know, but I've, I've, I've heard some really exceptional records by like certain artists who've made the records in their bedrooms in Brooklyn over the last two years. There's this one girl named Pronoun who I fucking love. She's fantastic. And she does 95% of it herself. Records are great. She's really fucking talented. And um, I feel like there's always going to be a lot of that anyway. You know what I mean? But I think once the shit's over, I feel like people are going to want to go back into a group. Yeah, oh, yeah. Definitely. There's, I've had, you know, a few experiences before the pandemic where, you know, five people in a room playing and it did the, just, you can't really recreate that energy with a plug-in. Um, but like I said, it, it goes both ways. I feel like both ways these days are valid. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, but I think people are going to be itching to get back in and have like just uh, the vibe of the life of, of everybody vibing off each other. Camaraderie is what you know. Hey. <clears throat> What I've been missing for a while now, honestly. Any more questions from the outside world there? Uh, no, I think we're good. I think five uh, things, we're, we're done an hour and a half. But um, anybody, I mean, it's great to see everyone and just keep keep strong and uh, hanging away and let's get through it and all get in a room together, you know. Um, let's do that. Sounds like a plan. I definitely. That's yeah, thank you guys. Sorry I was late. Ah. It is good to see you, Ed. <laughs> good to see you. Yeah. Jack, Hello, nice to Jack Shelly. Shelly, Jack, oh. Steve. Well, Steve, it's okay Steve. to see you. Annette. Cubby. Cubby. Rod. Cubby. Ed. <laughs> Do it. Stu, uh, thanks for covering for me. Paul, Paul Prestopino, wherever you are. Yeah. Yeah, wherever he is. Wherever <laughs> Paul is. <laughs> oh, my God. One thing, one thing, guys, and what Shelly said about the musician, um, you know, talking about Campbell and his guitar sound, I think that's ultimately important. You can get a, a shitty guitar, you know, have a shitty guitar and a shitty amp, a shitty drum, a set of drums. But if you get the right player and they have their sound, oh, that's yeah. all you have to capture. And I think... You know, we don't know that, but it's a, it's a good point, especially for the people. Yeah, works the other way around too. You can have the best stuff in the world, get a shitty player. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah for sure. I've had that happen. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Didn't you ever? See you guys. 
Yeah. Hey, yeah. Jack. All right. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Jack. Bye. 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 Bye.